So let's take a look at putting together an army of towering crusading nobles with an overview of starting Imperial Knights for 10th edition Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking Imperial Knights once again and in this video I thought we'd talk about starting an Imperial Knights army and the things that might have changed in getting an army together in 10th edition 40k. In the video we'll talk over why you might want to collect an Imperial Knights army in the first place, some of the pros and cons and looking at some of the models in their range, some ideas for planning out an army and getting a list together, talking about rules and first purchases and miniatures, an overview of the major kits in the range and finishing up with some thoughts on expanding the army and one example army list. Before we jump into it, I thought seeing as we're talking knights again, I will just mention my knight household giveaway here on the channel, where at the start of September this month's prize giveaway is for three custom knight households, and you can enter for that by either supporting the channel on Patreon or entering on Facebook. I'll talk through it more in a little bit more detail at the end of the video if you're interested in checking it out or entering for the draw. Starting out though, why collect knights in the first place? Overall I'd say they're a fairly fun army to collect in 40k and look pretty cool on the tabletop, basically an entire army of mini titans stomping towards the enemy. In the lore the Imperial Knights are essentially the 40k equivalent of questing nobles, clad in enormous great big titanic knight suits and fight as a massive shock force of super heavy walkers, destroying entire enemy formations with their armoured might. The knightly households are dedicated either to the Mechanicus or the Imperium, perhaps more sort of Knights of the Forge versus more sort of traditional households of questing knights, and they'll typically operate as forces with bonded armoured squires to attend them in their duties and do some of the more ignoble work. There's many classes of imperial knights and all sorts of different weapons that they can employ in laying low their enemies. Generally a force of them tends to destroy the enemy outright, packing thunderous firepower, titanic melee weapons and crushing the enemy under their feet if nothing else. Miniatures wise in 40k, the Imperial Knights is a small but nicely done range of fairly recent plastic models, all of their kits are from within the decade, and the army is mainly comprised of three different classes of knights, each of which have a bunch of multi-build different weapon options. I guess you could technically add the Serastus Knight Lancer to that for the plastic, though it is a bit more aimed at Horus Heresy than mainline 40k at the moment. In addition there's also a Forge World range of the Imperial Knights that provides you a few other classes, though those ones do tend to be a lot more expensive and are made in Forge World resin, which I don't think is generally quite as nice to work with as plastic miniatures. Looking at a few models from the range, here on the left we have a Knight Valiant, a Dominus class with an enormous flamethrower, an Armager Helverin, a Squire Tast with some great big auto cannons to lay the enemy low and is particularly good at anti-air, and a Knight Warden on the right, perhaps the most standard class of the Questorus Knights, he is armed with an Avenger Gatling cannon with a phenomenal rate of fire. Otherwise on the left, here's an Armager Warglaive, perhaps the front line of a lot of knight forces, a fairly fierce and melter weapon and a reaper chain cleaver in the left arm, the new knight Serastus Lancer kit with a great big shot lance and iron shield, and here on the right is one of the big forge world knights, that's the Acastus knight Porphyrion, pretty much a titan killer with some magna las cannons. Scale wise the armagers are medium sized vehicles in 40k, the big knights tend to tower over most other things on the table though, particularly the Serastus class. Price wise in 40k I'd say they're perhaps one of the cheaper armies as it goes, their kits are individually fairly expensive but you don't really need all that many of them and as knights have a fairly small range you don't actually have as far to go before you've basically collected most of the options that you have available to you. Certainly with a bit of magnetising you can have a fairly complete household on the go and be able to change up your knights pretty significantly game to game. In game in 40k their current rules are downloadable from Warhammer Community under downloads in the Warhammer 40,000 section. Playstyle wise they generally have big damage and defence, massive firepower tends to be their hallmark and a bit of noble melee to back that up. They'll often play a fair bit bonded with one big knight paired with an armager to give both of them extra benefits through their bondsman abilities and perhaps compared with their fallen chaos knight cousins they're a bit more of a raw damage and defence type army. A lot of their stratagems and army rules just add extra dangerousness or extra durability as opposed to messing around with things like battle shock. Currently in 40k I'd rate knights as fairly strong, a bit of a gatekeeper army I'd say where they kind of stat check the enemy's anti-tank guns. The very strongest stuff in the game might be odds on to beat them as they can deal with these big tough profiles but the vast majority of the field including a lot more mid tier armies can really struggle against them and knights can be fairly dominant. Overall it makes them maybe not one of the absolute top armies in a competitive setting but very very strong and even oppressive in casual. 
I would bear in mind that if you're getting into nights, it does have some downsides as well as positives. They are easy to get together, at least relatively cheap, and look pretty awesome on the tabletop, I think. But I would bear in mind that they do have a bit of a different feel to regular Warhammer 40k. They are, by their nature, a skew list, having far, far more vehicles than your opponent might expect in an army, and it might often mean that games aren't quite as interactive, particularly now 10th edition has made all their toughness profiles really quite big and basically kind of immune to a lot of small arms. It can just mean that you might have a fair few games where your opponent is just overwhelmed by their profiles, or some games when you're against some really solid anti-tank and lose your knights really quite quickly without much recourse. I think that's one of the reasons that knights often tend to be an army that people have in addition to a different army in 40k, and not just be their only primary one. They do have a pretty different way to play the game. Another reason for that might be that they also can serve as allies quite well for other imperial armies. You can include one titanic knight or a trio of armagers in another imperial force, so there's maybe a little bit of army building options that that gives you to have them in addition. In any case, if you do choose to pick up an imperial knight army and start collecting, and there's a fair few things that you can do to plan. Probably worth having a read over the rules from Index Imperial Knights, freely downloadable from Warhammer Community, or you could pick up some Index cards if you can find any. Otherwise, for research, Battlescribe, Warpedia, or Games Workshop app could help out for the rules and army list, give you an idea as to all the knight classes and what they do. You could try things out with Tabletop Simulator or proxying some models, and there's loads and loads of content here on YouTube as well. I've made a couple of Imperial Knight videos already for 10th edition, including a tier list and a general faction overview. I'll leave those links down in the video description. Otherwise though, there's loads of battle reports, painting guides, and lore in abundance on all sorts of other channels. Definitely can help just to have a bit of a general impression of the faction overall. Also definitely worth checking out social media, discords, Facebook groups, and subreddits dedicated to the faction. That can be a good place to ask some basic questions and just see general chatter about the army that you're thinking of collecting. When building a force of Imperial Knights, most forces tend to be at least somewhat similar to each other. You only do have three main classes of Knight for the most part, unless you dip into Forge World or pick up one of those new fancy Serastus. For the most part, the normal lists for them tended to have built around a fairly solid core of Questorus Knights, the most standard, iconic and flexible kit, backed up by a fair few Armagers, maybe things like a Dominus or Serastus in support maybe. You could definitely break that mould a bit though, and skew towards one type of Knight if you'd like, or decide that you're playing either a very ranged or a very melee army. The knights can do both pretty solidly, though usually it's going to make sense to have a mix of the two. Melee units pushing forward, ranged units holding down your home objective and drop zone. Then when you get going for painting your first model, it's either likely going to be a Questorus knight or an armager. Might be sensible to start with an armager, just to have a smaller canvas to work on, and try out colour schemes and make sure you're happy with it. It's a little bit less work to redo bits of it compared with an enormous Questorus if you decide you're not happy halfway through. Knights in particular have loads of scope for creativity, conversions and freehand if you want to. There's loads of inspiration on YouTube for things that you could do with them, and you can do funky things with their bases or try out some airbrush techniques. One tip that I would probably mention to newer players is that there is really quite a nice time-saving hack for painting knights. Most of them can generally be assembled with the vast majority of their main coloured armour plates left off. You can spray most of the knights silver and establish all the undercoat for them, and then spray all the armour panels separately, so you've got the core colour established both for the underlying mechanical parts and also their brightly coloured heraldry. That can certainly save a whole ton of time brushing in either one or the other. For knight colour schemes in Warhammer 40k, in previous editions of the game the different households have had different special rules, but in 10th edition it's all basically equal, you just get rules based on your detachment, and from the start of the edition knights only have the one. There are plenty of colour schemes that are established in the lore, you could go down a Mars type themed one with a lot of red, black and silver. The Questor Imperialis ones tend to go a bit more their own way, with things like Griffith or House Terran having different colour schemes and heraldry. I say knights are a particularly popular one for people just to make up their own colour schemes for their household though. I'd say that more people than not tend to create their own custom colour scheme as opposed to follow one of these guides. Otherwise, talking first purchases, as mentioned you can pick up the army rules and some background for them if you'd like. Games Workshop has made some index cards that come bundled with the Chaos Knight army set as well. Unfortunately they basically sold out of a whole load of those so you might be able to find some second hand. And I have seen a few places for guides for printing out the PDF type things, which could be handy enough as a reference. They're perhaps not essential though, knights don't have all that many data sheets. it's not really all that hard to reference via the PDFs. You can also use Games Workshop's app for reference as well, but it does require a Warhammer Plus subscription, so it isn't free. 
Otherwise, for a bit of background reading, you could think about picking up a past codex for a bunch of lore and pictures. The rule set won't be working for them at the moment, though it can be kind of nice just to have a whole load of details and some physical things to read over, plus they can often be found at least fairly cheap second hands. At the moment, we don't know exactly when the Imperial Knights Codex is coming out for 10th edition. Seems like it's going to be next summer at the very earliest, though it could be significantly later than that. Games Workshop's only revealed the Codex releases up to Spring 2023, so we don't know what's coming after that. It could be early in the edition, or could be late. Otherwise though, rules aside, let's talk miniatures. I think in general the recommended things that I'd start Imperial Knights with would probably be a box of armagers and a Questorist Knight box set, probably purchased around about the same sort of time or one after the other. At the moment, Knights don't have any sort of discount bundles for Warhammer 40k. I think that's partly just due to having so few kits in the first place, so any sort of discount bundle would basically mean that you're getting the entire army cheaper. A long time ago they had a Knight Renegade box set with a couple of Questorus fighting in it. I'd be surprised to find any of that around though, that's gone for a long time. Though they did have a slightly more recent Christmas box set with a Questorus Knight and some Armagers. Again, kind of unlikely to see that going anywhere, as it basically just was a flat discount and got snapped up by people very quickly. If you are looking for older Questorus Knights, I would also bear in mind that some of them come with only a few of the options. They originally were just the Errant and Paladin, and Games Workshops expanded the kit twice since then, so some older kits might not have all the parts if you desperately want a Warden, a Gallant, or a Preceptor or something. Talking through the kits individually, first up we have the Knight Armagers. These are £55, €70 Euros, or $90 from Games Workshop. These ones contain two small knights that can either be built as Warglaives or Helverins. In general, most knight forces want to have a fair amount of these, so they can use the bondsman abilities with the Questoris or the Serastus if you've got them. It kind of encourages knight armies to have a fairly even mix, maybe slightly more on the armager side than the big knights, if anything. They are quite nice models to get a feel of the range. Not too bad for Games Workshop's value for two vehicles in one box set like this. Other armies might pay a similar amount just for one tank or something. And I feel like both of them are really quite usable in-game at the moment. I'd probably rate the Warglaives a little bit higher than the Helverins, though both are useful. I'd probably want a few more Warglaives than the Helverins overall in the force. You could definitely think about magnetising them, though if you had to choose the top gun, I'd be more tempted by the Stubber at the moment compared with the Melter. When you're picking up 40k kits, I would also bear in mind the different ways that you can think about buying them. Direct from Games Workshop tends to be the most reliable, and they're the ones who tend to get things back in stock the fastest, as would make sense, though there's plenty of other ways that you could get things a bit cheaper. Local gaming stores around the world tend to have fairly good discounts. Element Games in the UK usually gives 15% discounts, and that's linked in the video description. And also there's Noble Knight Games in the USA for 8% off, or Gap Games in Australia usually for 20% off. They're all linked down below, any things bought through them do help support the channel. I certainly do recommend gaming stores like that, they can save you an enormous amount of money over the course of a Warhammer collection. You could also think about the second hand market as well. eBay is definitely well worth a look, though you could have some variable quality and kits are being a bit mistreated or caked in paint. You need to judge how good the one is from the picture. And also I bear in mind that there's loads of options from 3D printing or third party manufacturers. Lots of great alternative sculpts exist, particularly for aesthetic customizations for knights. I've seen things like ones with space wolf heads, or ones with great big solid shields, or having their melee weapons replaced by a mace or an axe or something. Lots of people have been quite creative there. It can be kind of handy for getting your hands on alternative parts and weapons as well, if you want to magnetise some things up. I have had recommendations from a company called Taro Model Maker as well, who make really quite a lot of custom knight parts. For the other big kits in the range, the Questorus Knight is £105, €140, Euros, or $170 from Games Workshop, so definitely a fairly pricey kit there, though if you were, say, playing a 2,000 point game of Warhammer 40k, this would be around about a quarter of your army in one miniature. The Questorus kit has a lot of options and is very flexible. It builds any one of six main variants, the Errant, Paladin, Gallant, Preceptor, Crusader, Warden, and Canis Rex. It also comes with the fun little knight pilot for Sir Hector, which is quite a nice little miniature to paint up on its own. You use him if you're fielding Canis Rex, and then Sir Hector gets out if the knight's destroyed. If you do have the time and patience for it, I would absolutely recommend magnetising these. There's all sorts of guides on YouTube that can tell you how to do that better than I can, but I feel like if there's just about any kit that it's worth learning magnets for, then it's these guys. The kit's really quite modular, and you don't really want to be buying or breaking entire knight kits each time you want to change loadouts. 
and it's really quite cool to be able to shake up the loadouts between games or make changes when Games Workshop inevitably changes the balance of things. You could also think about magnetising the knight at the waist as well, that makes him far easier to store and can make her a bit more poseable. Currently in game at the moment, perhaps the Warden Crusader and Canis Rex are perhaps the standout Questorus variants, though most of them are usable enough, and that definitely can change if Games Workshop decides to shift around points a bit. For the top guns, probably the Storm Spear missile pod is the best of the three, now they're all free. And I perhaps slightly prefer the Reaper Chainsaw to the Thunderstrike Gauntlets in melee, though it does kind of depend on what you're fighting against. Some of them are better against some targets and worse against others. The other mainline Imperial Knight Kit is the Dominus Knight Kit. This one's £110, €145 Euros, or $185 from GW. This one builds either the Castellan or the Valiant Kit. These guys are either close range or long range firepower knights, absolutely covered in guns, a little bit harder to kill, though maybe having a little bit less synergy with the rest of the army, they're kind of just big gun turrets. I'd say both of them are usable enough in game at the moment, though maybe not absolutely top tier for Imperial Knights, but I think they're in a fairly good place and are definitely playable. Otherwise, for the rest of the range, the only other plastic one is the Serastus Knight Lancer. This one's boxed and is slightly more aimed for Horus Heresy than 40k, though Games Workshop do seem to be pretty keen to keep this in the range, unlike a bunch of the other things that they sent to Legends. This one is the most expensive of the lot though, and doesn't build any of the other variants of Serastus, it is just literally the Lancer that you see here. It is very tall though, and stands far higher than the Dominus. Otherwise, for the Forge World Knights, there's the Castigator and Acheron, that are kind of similar to this Serastus Knight Lancer, but with different weapons. They'll also be released in plastic at least fairly soon at time of recording. And then there's a few other fancy variants, a different flavour of Armager in the Moirax, really big Acastus Knights that absolutely dominate the battlefield but cost loads of points, and some Questor variants as well. All the resin ones do cost significantly more than Games Workshop's own offerings though, around about double the price on already fairly expensive models, and they do have a bit of a history of not being enormously well supported rules wise, though they're not doing too badly at the moment. As mentioned, if you can be bothered to magnetise, then I certainly would do with the knights. Both the big knights and the armagers really can swap out their weapons very very easily if you magnetise them in the right places, and it is quite satisfying to change between the two when rules change. It means that you don't really need to have all that many models in your army to have basically the entire codex's worth of options, all in just a few choices, and they can switch out. You could also think about painting them up as a sort of renegade house, one that maybe blurs the line a little bit between Chaos and Imperial, and have the option to fill them as Chaos Knights as well if the fancy takes you. And they're definitely a lot more spiky and edgy looking than the Imperial Knights, but they're definitely an army that you could flip between the two rule sets if you wanted to try out what they have to offer. Once you've got a small base, say for example a Questorus Knight with a bunch of options and a couple of armagers, you can start to expand more from there. If you are looking at something like a 2000 point Imperial Knight army, I'd probably aim for around about the options of around 2 or 3 different Titanic Knights, maybe 2 Questorus and a Dominus for example, ideally magnetised for the options if you can be bothered. And then maybe aim for 4 to 6 armagers with a mix between the Warglaives and Helverins, if you don't have the option of magnetising, then probably more Warglaves than Helverins overall, I'd say. You could definitely think about adding other fancier options, like Forge World Things or the Serastus Lancer if you fancied. I'd perhaps do that after establishing this little core, though. Another option that you could use would be to add some Imperial Agents in. Sometimes they're useful for Knights, sometimes they're not, but at least at the moment you've got the option of fielding things like Assassins or some Inquisitorial Retinues, could be helpful for doing some little objectives while your knights get around to stomping the enemy army. Putting that all together for one example, here's just one idea for a 2000 point knight army list. I'm not saying that this is enormously optimal or anything like that, but should be strong enough to hold its own with a fair few 40k armies at least. In this army we've got a knight crusader, which is the Questorus with all the guns. This one's got a rapid fire battle cannon and an avenger gatling cannon for a fairly phenomenal rate of fire. Storm spear missile pod, heavy stubber, and it's got an enhancement that allows it to give its Bondsman ability to two different armages, as it can have two of them hitting on a 2+, plus, ideally those Helverins. Then there's a Knight Warden, which is the one with another Avenger Gatling Cannon. This one gets some devastating wounds against infantry for extra threat, and the Warden's particularly nice at the moment, as it has minus one damage for both itself and its bonded armager, making it just phenomenally tanky. This one takes a Reaper Chainsword, Storm Spear Missile Pod, and it's got the Unyielding Paragon Enhancement, which worsens enemy AP. Then for the frontline knights, we've got the Armager Warglaives with heavy stubbers and dealing a fair bit of anti-tank damage with their big melter weapons. 
They can be trading out on the midfield objectives, giving and receiving blows with the enemy, and then two Armager Helverins that could be useful for holding more backfield objectives and receiving some of the nice shooting buffs from the Crusader. Then just to back up the Knights, there's a Vindicare Assassin and an Adeptus Arbites Exaction Squad, or little units to perhaps try and hide on an objective somewhere, or do some tactical secondaries that your big knights don't really want to be bothered going around to do. And then finally, an annoying lone operative Vindicare Assassin that has some pretty scary threat against enemy characters. He could also be a slightly ignoble way to fulfil your oath and kill the enemy warlord for Lay Low the Tyrants, which gives the knight army a really big boost. I say that's at least fairly strong for knights at the moment, though obviously things could certainly change as Games Workshop adjusts points values. So anyway, hope you've enjoyed a few insights as to creating an Imperial Knight army for 10th edition 40k. As always, feel free to let me know your thoughts and ideas down in the comments, or any other tips that you'd have for new players. Just getting back to the channel September giveaway though, and this one's going to be for 3 custom knight households. Could be one potential way to start an army if you fancied entering for it. It was quite a popular giveaway last time I ran it. The three winners of this one will get any three of the big Titanic Knights produced by Games Workshop in plastic, either Imperial or Chaos, depending on whether you're a Loyalist or Traitor, and any of those big Knights can be swapped out for four Armagers or War Dogs. It means that, say, you could have one Titanic Knight and eight Armagers or War Dogs if you fancied. As per normal with the channel giveaways, there's two equal ways to enter, both of them links down by the video description. Either support the channel on Patreon for any amount, which is what allows me to keep on making all these videos all the time, and keep all the 40k content coming. Channel patrons are automatically entered each month. Otherwise, there's also the option to support the channel on social media to enter. That's completely free, and you can do so by doing three actions. Subscribe to the YouTube channel and like the Facebook page, and then to actually enter the draw, then you respond to a Facebook post that appears on the 1st of September 2023. Reply to that post with a photo of any 40k mini or imagery, along with your name and the date handwritten within the photo, just to deter Facebook bots and spammers. Then when all the entries are in, I put them all together and do the draw via a random number generator and announce it on a channel update video around about the 4th of September. After that, I'll then get in touch with the people who've won, ask which knights you'd like, and then of course they'll be posted to you once I receive them from Games Workshop or a local gaming store. Hopefully it could be one way to get a few more knight armies out there, and of course there'll be further giveaways like this every month. Feel free to check out the Patreon page or the Facebook page, both of those are linked down in the video description. In any case, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics if you'd like to see more like this. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, and I'll aim to continue this Start Collecting series to talk about other factions in the game. There are a few other benefits for supporting the channel on Patreon if you'd like to, as well as entering in for the prize draws each month, there's the chance to see some certain videos early, a few votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and other things like your name in the credits and things for higher backers. If any of that's of interest, then check out the link in the video description. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.